So there are, I take it, several notions of the direct reference. And I want to talk about them. There is one that's uh, sort of the standard notion, one that's the historical notion, and, and, and I'm going basically to choose between them. But the historical notion is the one I start with. That's the million notion. The idea that direct reference is reference that is direct in a very strong sense. That's the idea that among the expressions that we use to talk about things, to refer to things in the environment, some are referential in a very strong sense because they are directly associated with a particular object. They are like tags uh, assigned to particular objects, and we use them to talk about the objects without implying anything about the objects. It is just a convention that this expression refers to that object. And proper names are, su are supposed to be directly referential in that sense. They are mere tags, according to Mill. That's uh, why the view is called million. They are tags conventionally associated with an expression, and there is no particular mode of presentation. There is no way in which you have to think of the, the reference uh, when, when you refer to it by a name. Uh, I have a quote from uh, Genoveva Marti that I'm going to use later in fuller version, where she says that what defines direct reference is the absence of what she calls a semantic mechanism to search for and determine the reference. What she means here is that uh, in the case of other expressions that are not directly referential, the expression may be associated with a, a certain criterion uh, for determining the reference or a certain uh, condition that the reference has to satisfy. And whenever that's the case, whenever the, the, an expression is associated with a particular criterion of identification or condition that the reference has to satisfy, the reference is presented in a certain way, namely as the object that satisfies the condition. In that case, there is a mode of presentation of the object. But with proper names, the idea is that there is no mode of presentation. There is this direct association between the expression and the object without any condition or mechanism that determines the reference. That's the, what I call the traditional notion of, uh, or the historical notion of direct reference. So the contrast here, the, the, the striking contrast, is between proper names, which are directly referential in that sense, that they are associated directly with, a, assigned directly to a, an object, and other expressions which, on the contrary, present the reference as satisfying certain conditions, having certain properties. And the sort of expression that is obviously displays those features are definite descriptions, like, for example, the president of this university. I don't know whether this university has a president, but let's suppose, suppose anyway, if, if that expression, that description refers to anyone, that would be because the person in question satisfies the proper, has the property of being the president of this university. There is a particular condition that has to be satisfied for anything to be the reference of such an expression. So the reference is, uh, depends upon the condition being satisfied, so the reference is mediated by the satisfaction of the condition. So reference is not direct in the sense in which when you use a proper name, you just refer without there being any condition that the reference satisfies. So that's the idea. And indeed, there is evidence uh, that there is a deep difference between, say, proper names and definite descriptions. Because a description, like the president or anything of the sort, the definite description refers to the individual that has a certain property, and which individual that is may depend upon the situation you're talking about. Uh, so the reference of a description really depends upon the circumstances. It's not fixed once for all. So for example, take the description, the US president. That description refers to whoever is the US president. And who that is depends upon the circumstances. That changes with each election. And, and, and that shows this dependence upon the, of the reference upon the circumstance. Uh, shows when you have a, an operator like, uh, say, a temporal operator, for example. So if I say uh, the U.S. in, uh, in uh, 1960, the U.S. president was very young. Suppose I say that. That can mean two things, depending on the situation you're talking about. So when you say the U.S. president, you may be talking about the U.S. president in the current situation, namely Trump. That's what, and then in that case, you mean by in 1960, the president was very young. You mean that in 1960, he, Trump, was very young. But there is another reading in which 
you understand the description, the president, you, you fix the reference with respect to a circumstance that's not the current circumstance, but rather the circumstance you're talking about, namely in 1960. And now you, the, 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 the individual you pick out is the individual who is president of the US in 1960, and that's no longer Trump. So that's a possible reading of the sentence in 1960, the president was very young. You, it's possible to mean by this sentence that in 1960 there was a president in the US and he was very young at the time, so he was a young president. That's certainly one possible reading. And what makes these two readings possible is the fact that the description, the, pre the US president, refers to whoever is president in the situation we're talking about. And here there are two possible situations because there is this temporal operator in 1960. So the situation we're talking about may be either the situation in 1960 or possibly the situation in which we are now. There are two situations relevant to this utterance. And that gives us two readings. Because, the, again, the reference depends upon the situation, there are two situations, so there are two possible readings. But if you use a proper name in the same, certain, in, in the same sort of context, you get a totally different result. So suppose that instead of the US president, you have something like, in 1960, Trump was very young. Yes, we understand what it means. It means what it means, and there is only one reading, which is like the first reading I talked about. Here, Trump has got to refer to Trump. Uh, whether we're talking about the current situation or the situation in 1960 doesn't change. The reference of Trump is Trump. The, the name is associated with that individual. Whatever you're talking about, if you use the name Trump, you're going to talk about him because that's the reference of the name. While in the case of a de definite description, as I said, the reference depends upon additional factors and can vary with the circumstance. So that's, people talk about the rigidity of the proper name. That's the idea that the proper name always refers to the same individual, namely the individual that has been assigned to the name. While for definite description, the definite description refers to whoever satisfies the description, on, and that might be different individuals in different situations. Okay. So that goes with this idea that names are directly referential, while descriptions are not. So one way to to put the matter is to use the notion of uh, content or semantic content, where the semantic content, well, I'm not going to say exactly what semantic content is, but we can contrast the two cases, the case of the description and the case of the name, by saying that the content of a name is directly an object, the object that is referred to by the name, the object that you're talking about. That's the contribution that the name makes to the content of the utterance or to the truth conditions. The role of a name is just to introduce a certain object for the discourse to be about, which is what Mill says about names. But descriptions, for descriptions, the content of the description, its contribution, uh, semantic contribution, is not directly an object. It's the condition that I talked about, a certain mode of presentation. And the object itself only comes into the picture because it is the object that actually satisfies the condition or fits the mode of presentation. So the idea is that when you use a name that immediately uh, introduces an object into the content, the object that you're talking about, Trump, for example, when you use a definite description, what goes into the content is a certain condition, descriptive condition, or mode of presentation. And that determines an object, which is the object that satisfies the description. And that may be called the reference in some weak sense, but that's not directly a constituent of the content. And for example, it's possible to understand the con a sentence with a definite description, even if you don't identify the object that satisfies the description. It doesn't matter, because really what the description does is introduce a certain condition to the, the content. Now, what are modes of presentation on the talk about conditions? Well, we can model them as functions from situations to individuals. That is, given a situation, the mode of presentation selects the object, if there is one and it's unique, in the situation that fits the, the condition, that satisfies the condition. Something like this. So the mode of presentation selects the right individual, the individual that satisfies the criterion. Okay, so that's the sort of, a, the, the sort of historical picture. But there is a complication. There is a reason not to be wholly satisfied with that picture. 
of the contrast between direct referential expressions like proper names and non-direct referential expressions like definite descriptions, which carry descriptive content and express a mode of presentation rather than directly refer to an object. The problem is due to the existence of another category of expressions that are neither names nor descriptions that are sort of intermediate. So we have to make room for them. So these expressions are the indexicals. And the problem with indexicals is that they are a bit like descriptions in the sense that they have descriptive content. So we may admit, even though that's controversial, that proper names have no descriptive content. They are mere types. But indexicals, they do have a descriptive content. Like, I refer to the person who's speaking, or the agent, or something like this. You refer to the person who's being told to, the addressee. So those are conventional condition associated with this expression I, you, here refers to the place where one is. So in each case, there is a certain criterion that determines what counts as the reference of here, I, you. And, and this is very much like what you have in the case of description. Indeed, there is a sort of equivalence between the word I and the description, the person who's speaking to you, something like this. It's sort of equivalent. Uh, or well, sort of, because of course there are semantic differences. So in a way, the indexicals are like descriptions, that they carry descriptive content. But on the other hand, they are also like names in being rigid, in the sense that when you say you, you're actually saying something about the person you, who you are addressing. And, and, and the link between the, the word you that you use on the person in question is not affected by the situation you're talking about. So, for example, take the case I mentioned, the case with the, with the temporal operator in 1960. You were very young. If I say that to Trump, for example, that has only one meaning. That means that he, Trump, was very young in 1960. There is, no there is no other reading. So that means basically that the mode of presentation associated with you, namely the person I'm addressing now, that mode of presentation, you cannot, the, it cannot select uh, uh, its reference in the situation we're talking about, let's say, in 1960. The sentence doesn't say and cannot mean that the person I was addressing in 1960 was then very young. That's not possible. So we don't have anything like what we have with definite description. It seems that you has got to refer to the person I'm addressing now, which, whatever the situation I'm talking about. So the reference is fixed independently of the situation talked about. Of course, it's fixed not, it's not independent of the context in which I speak. But still, we find that this is a very different behavior than, than definite description, and that indexicals are as rigid as, as definite descriptions. So the, this is a sort of a puzzle, and the solution to the puzzle, which has, I mean, most people accept something like this solution, is to maintain the idea that modes of presentation are something like conditions which an entity has to meet in order to be the reference. And as I said, those conditions may be represented as functions from situations to individuals. In a given situation, they select the individual that satisfies the condition. But now we must add that the function can apply either to the context of utterance or to the situation we're talking about. So there are these two possibilities. So that's more or less what we saw in the case of, uh, of uh, when I mentioned the two possible readings for, for, for the description, the president of the US, when I said that in 1960, the president of the US was very young. You can apply the mode of presentation to the situation in 1960. You look for the person who's president of the US there. And what you're saying is that that person was very young then. One reading, other reading, you take the mode of presentation and you apply it to the current situation, the situation in which I speak. And in our situation, the president of the US is, is Trump. And in that 
when I apply the mode operation of the function to that situation, the individual I get, as a result, the value is actually Trump, the person who is now president of the US. So there are these two possibilities for a mode representation. It can apply to the context or to the circumstance. And now the idea is that in the case of, the, of indexicals, there's something in the semantics of indexical that forces us. There is a mode representation. There is a certain condition that's semantically associated with the indexical. But there is some additional element in the semantics that forces us to evaluate the mode representation with respect to the context. And the situation of evaluation, the situation we're talking about, is irrelevant and doesn't play any role. So we can maintain that there is a mode of presentation in this case, as in the case of definite description. But with definite description, you can choose the reference, select the reference in any situation, the situation talked about, or the situation of utterance. While in the case of indexicals, you are bound to select the reference in the context of utterance. And the situation has no impact on this. The situation talked about has no impact on this. So this gives us the following picture, which is, as I said, very widespread. So suppose there is an expression associated with a mode of presentation, a certain condition that the reference has to satisfy. If the mode of presentation applies to the context of utterance, the situation in which the speaker is speaking, then the object that it selects, the object that satisfies the condition, goes into the proposition expressed or into the content. And now we have a singular content. We have a content or a proposition that's about a particular object, namely the object that satisfies the condition in the context of use. And, and, and in this case, the mode of presentation is, itself does not occur in the content. It's pre-semantic, as it were. It does not occur in the content of what is said, but it, it is used to determine the content, in the content in context. So basically, that's what you do when you say you. When you say you, there is a certain condition being the person being ad addressed by me, the person to whom I'm speaking. We use this condition to identify an object in the context, and we take that object and it goes into the content. And the content of what is said is that this individual has the further property, say, of being very young, or whatever. So in this case, the content is, as we say, singular. It's about the proposition, the content, what is said, is about a particular object. We're talking about a particular object. And that's the intuition we have in the case of uh, indexicals that you. If I say to Trump, uh, you are F, or whatever the F is, or in, in 1960, you were very young, I'm really talking about him. I must write into him a certain property, namely the property of having been young in 1960, or whatever. So the, the content, the proposition, is about Trump. Just like if I use the name Trump, if I say in 1960 Trump was very young, again, I'm talking about Trump, that individual, I'm saying something about him, namely that he has a certain property or has a certain property. But the other option is that the mode of presentation does not apply to the context of utterance, is not used to determine what is said. Rather, the mode of presentation goes into the content. That's what I said about definite descriptions. I said that in the case of definite descriptions, the semantic contribution of the description is the mode of presentation, a certain condition. That's part of the proposition. And we are not talking about a particular individual. We're rather talking about whoever satisfies the condition. So the condition is the, the, what you have to grasp if you are to understand the utterance. It's part of the content. And in, this case, in that case, we said that the content is not singular. It's not about a particular object. It's general. So for example, if I say the president of the US lives in the White House, of course, that applies to Trump. But I'm not talking specifically about Trump. I'm talking about whoever is the president of the US. And we can indeed use this phrase, whoever he is. The president of, U of the US, whoever he is, lives in the White House. This statement is about the property of being president of the US and the property of living in the White House. And it's, it establishes a certain connection between these properties. So that's something that's general. I'm not talking in particular about a, an individual, even if what I say applies to that individual. So in that case, we want to say that the mode of presentation being the US president is part of the content. While in the other case, what was part of the content was the individual selected by the mode of presentation when applied to the context. 
So the president of the US, whoever he is, lives in the White House. That's a general proposition. Well, you live in the White House when I speak to Trump is a singular proposition about Trump. So that's the, the idea. And you see that uh, there, that's a new notion, really, of, of direct reference that we have now. It's no longer the idea that uh, direct reference is the case in which there is no mode of presentation. The expression is directly assigned to an object, or an object is directly assigned to the expression without it, there being any condition that the object has to satisfy. That's not at all the notion we have now. Now we have the idea that the directly referential expression in the new sense, which is a weaker sense, is an expression such that its content, what it contributes to the truth conditions of the utterance. What it contributes, or its content, is the entity, the object it refers to, irrespective of the way that entity is presented. So the entity is presented in a certain way. When I say to Trump, you are living the White House, I'm referring to Trump as you, and via the property of addressing that I'm addressing him, that's how I'm identifying him, as it were. But that property doesn't go into the content. It's used to determine what goes into the content, namely Trump. It's a, I'm expressing the singular proposition about Trump, and the mode of presentation the person I'm addressing is used only to determine which individual goes into the content. It's very different from the other case in which when I said the president of the US, whoever he is, lives in the White House, now what goes into the content is not a particular individual, but it's the, the condition itself, the condition being president of the US. So when the content includes, in, in, when in the content you find a particular individual and the content is singular, the mode of presentation through which you determine that individual doesn't matter. It was, as I said, pre semantic, it was a previous step. Once you get the content, the content is about a particular individual, and that's the only thing you care about at the level of truth conditions. OK, so the, as I said, it's a weaker notion of direct reference. And to sum up, now we have a, a view that's sort of a more general, more comprehensive, because it, it, it works not only for names and descriptions, as the previous view did, but also for indexicals, which were a problem for the previous view. So now we have a, three types of expressions. We have proper names for which we can maintain, if we want to, that there is no mode of presentation. There are mere tags. So the content can only be singular. There is only an object that's contributed by the name. So that object has got to go into the content. The content is singular. But with indexicals, there is a mode of presentation. There is a certain condition that the reference has to satisfy. But there is, as I said, an additional feature an additional semantic feature that forces the mode of presentation to apply to the context of utterance rather than to the situation of evaluation situation we're talking about. And so here the mode of presentation exists, but it plays only this pre-semantic role of determining which object we're talking about, but what goes into the content is the object, so the content is singular. So there are two types of case in which the content is singular. Either there is no mode of presentation, that's the case of proper names, or there is a mode of presentation, but it has a restricted role. It's there only to fix the object we're talking about, but the mode of presentation doesn't go into the content. It has this pre-semantic role. Now, what about definite descriptions on that feature? Well, with definite descriptions, as for indexicals, there is a mode of presentation. But in contrast to indexicals, there is no semantic or lexical feature which forces us to use the to give to the mode of presentation only this restricted pre-semantic rule of determining which object goes into the, the singular content. With descriptions, the mode of presentation may apply either to the context of utterance or to the situation talked about. We can freely choose. And therefore, there are two readings. When you have, say, in a case like the case I mentioned, in which you're talking about the situation distinct from the situation you're in. So instead of talking about this current situation, I'm talking about the situation in 1960, and I say, in 1960, the US president was very young. I have a choice. I can, my mode of presentation associated with the description can apply either to the context, and that gives us Trump as the object that satisfies the condition in the context, and then I express the singular proposition about Trump to the effect that in 1960, he was very young. But there is also the other possibility. I apply the mode of presentation to the situation I'm talking about, the situation in 1960. And what I'm saying is that the individual who was the, the US president in that situation was very young then. 
And that gives us the other reading. So that's the, the view. And as I said, so this is the second option for direct reference. This is not the traditional conception. This is the, the conception that arose as a result of theorizing about indexicals. So for example, that's the view you find in David Kaplan's work, this sort of an approach. Uh, also, Stonecker had uh, very similar uh, ideas about uh, these cases. Uh, I mentioned both of them, Kaplan and Stonecker, because in the 70s, uh, they both theorized about the two uses of definite descriptions. And indeed, the, there is this well-known work on the, by Keith Donnellan on the two uses of definite description, the attributive and the referential use. And there are all sorts of theories about uh, how to understand this the distinction between two types of use. But both Kaplan and, at the time, Stolnaker, because I don't think that Stolnaker still likes this picture, but at the time, they both offer the sort of two-dimensional accounts of, of, of the distinction, which corresponds to what I've just said, that is, The idea is that the sentence, a sentence like, so df is g, or the US president is very young. Suppose, I, suppose that's the sentence. The two uses correspond to the case in which there is one case in which the sentence expresses a singular proposition about the object which the speaker takes to be the object that satisfies the condition, being the US president. Or it may express a general proposition about whoever satisfies the condition. And we don't have any particular individual in mind. We're not talking about any particular individual. So in the first case, in the second case, rather, the motorization belongs to the content and applies to the circumstance. The, of evaluation, while in the first case, the mode of presentation applies to the context and, and belongs to a different semantic level. So Kaplan distinguishes character and content, and that applies here, but I'm not going to say. To say how, what matters is that when they are referentially used, definite descriptions work exactly like indexicals. They pick out in an object in context using a certain criterion, and then something is said about that object. So the, the mode of presentation associated with the expression has only this pre-semantic rule fixing, fixing the reference in context. But what you're saying is something about that individual. You're expressing the singular proposition. So the, 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 you probably know this uh, Donnellan distinction, but the, the, what he calls the attributive use of a definite is description, that's the case in which we express a general proposition. And that's the case in which we can say whoever he is, or we can add this expression. So the president of the US, whoever he is, is, is very young or lives in the White House, whatever. Here you're talking, you're not talking, don't have any particular individual in mind, or if you have, it doesn't matter. You're really talking about, you're expressing something general. You could use a quantifier to say the same sort of thing. Well, in the case of the referential use, you use the description because you have a certain individual in mind, and you believe that that individual satisfies a certain condition. So you use the condition to enable your hearers to understand who you're talking about. So for example, I might think, I might be deluded into thinking that Mike Spence is the US president. And I see Mike Spence, and I might say something like, oh, the US president is very young. If that's crazy, because it's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So in that sort of case, I would use the description of the US president because I want to say something about that guy, Mike Pence. And I happen to believe that he's the US president. So I'm using the description in an instrumental manner to let you identify whom I'm talking about. But I'm really talking about a particular individual. And as Donnellan says, if it turns out that the guy I want to talk about, the guy I have in mind, is not the satisfier of the condition, is not the US president, as in this case, then what I will do is that I will change, I will, I will use another description. Because what I meant, I, I was talking about that guy. But when I'm talking about the president, whoever he is, of course, I will stick to my description because it's essential. The mode of presentation is part of the content that I want to convey. All right. OK, so that's the second view. That's the Kaplanian picture, as I said. And now it's the most widespread view about the direct reference. Uh, people who talk about direct reference, what they have in mind is uh, the Kaplanian picture. Not the million picture, because the million picture has a bit, uh, 
problem when it comes to indexical. It doesn't account for them. It only works for proper names, assuming that they are what the million says they are. OK, but even though this view, the Kaplanian picture, is the most widespread picture, and many people accept it, there are some reasons to be not fully satisfied with it. And in particular, it's possible, I take it, to make sense of what I call here the million protest. So there are people who are millions. They like the historical picture, and I think it sort of can be defended. So I don't know how they would defend it, but, but, but I will offer a possible defense. So I mentioned Genoveva Marti, who is a million, and, and I had a, a quotation from her. Now, this is a, a longer quotation from the same paper. I've got an even fuller this quotation a bit later. She says something like, she doesn't like this characterization of the referential use of a definite description. So she accepts that definite description can be used in this purely referential manner to talk about a guide that we have in mind in such a way that the descriptive content of the description doesn't matter very much. It's there only to let you identify the guy we're talking about, but, but we are really expressing the singular proposition about the guy. So she likes that idea that we can use definite description referentially. But she still thinks that we must stick to the idea that direct reference is the case in which reference is determined directly and not via certain conditions. So and, and what she says here, she says what defines a referential use of a definite description or any device is the absence of a semantic mechanism to search for and determine the reference. So the idea is that there are cases in which the reference is determined by a certain criterion. We have a criterion. We look for the individual who satisfies the criterion. That's not direct reference. That's indirect reference. That's reference via properties. And there is something which is genuine direct reference. That's the case in which we refer, but not via a criterion. So that sort of corresponds to the million ID. That in the case of names, we don't have any criterion. There is this direct association. And but we saw that we cannot maintain this view because of indexicals, because indexicals seem to be directly referential, and still there is a criterion. But what someone like Genoveva Marti says is that we should stick to that old picture because it's the right picture. We should say that whenever we have the intuition of direct reference, like, for example, in the case of the referential use of definite descriptions, or perhaps also in the case of indexicals, we should maintain that in that case, we don't have a semantic mechanism that search for and that we don't have any criterion that we use. And she pursues, she proceeds, if a definite description can be used as a device of direct reference, the attributes associated with it, that is the descriptive content associated with the description, should not play a role in the determination of reference. Now this second part is important because it shows that it's possible for an expression to carry descriptive content to be associated with a criterion or with a certain condition and still be used directly in a direct, re directly referential manner, provided the criterion in question is not what determines the reference. So it's a sort of a, she sort of enlarges this notion of this traditional notion of direct reference. It's the idea that the reference is not determined by a criterion, by certain conditions that an object has to satisfy. But this is compatible with the expression encoding certain conditions, provided those conditions are not what determines the reference. So let's try to see what we can do, starting from, from this idea. And actually, there is now a very popular idea that I think that uh, fits with this what, what Marty says rather well, it's the idea that we have a sort of very basic distinction. It's not about language, it's really about the mind, between two types of thoughts about particular objects. So on the one hand, we have singular thoughts about particular objects, thoughts that are really about particular objects as such. And there are thoughts that are not about particular objects as such, even though the thought applies to, as I said, particular objects. So that's the case in which 
the, 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 uh, that's a sort of thought that we may call a descriptive thought. So that corresponds to this idea of a thought being general and not, not really about, uh, about an individual. So, so the case in which we have a descriptive thought is, according to this view, the case in which the reference, the object that we're thinking about, is determined satisfactorily by the satisfaction of certain condition. So I'm thinking of, I have a certain condition in mind, being the US president. And if I think the US president, whoever he is, lives in the White House, there is this condition, this property being the US president, and that determines an object, namely the object who satisfies the property. So my thought is in a loose sense, and weak sense, about that object, but, but, it's, but, but it's not a singular thought about that object. I'm not specifically thinking about that, that individual, that, as I said. Or that's really what I said earlier. And the contrast is with the case in which the reference is not determined by the satisfaction of certain conditions. The reference is given directly. And here now we're talking about the mind, as I said, no longer about language. And here the idea of the reference being given directly to the subject is the case in which the subject is acquainted with the object. So there are objects that can, that can think about via certain properties, like I think about the first baby to be born in the next century. That's a description. I can think about a certain baby through that description, but the only thing that's given to me is the description. My reach, my connection to the object is only via the description. And that's very different from the case in which I'm shown a certain baby that I can't see in front of me. In that case, I'm directly acquainted with the object. And the idea is that we have singular thoughts when we are directly acquainted with the object, like, for example, in perception. And we have descriptive thoughts when we are not acquainted with the object, but rather we are thinking of the object through a certain conceptual description as the object that has such and such properties. So that's a contrast that's very much used in the philosophy of mind. And it seems to rest on the contrast between two, way in, two ways in which the reference is determined. The reference may be determined satisfactorily via the satisfaction of certain conceptual conditions that you have in mind, or the object may be determined directly, the object to which you're related, say, through perception. So the contrast here you find in this quote from Ken Bach, the contrast between two modes of reference determination, and that contrast grounds the distinction between singular and descriptive thought, or de re thought and, singular and descriptive thought, as he said. So I read the, the quotation. Since the object of a descriptive thought is determined satisfactorily, the fact that the thought is of that object does not require any connection between thought and object. However, the object of a de re thought, or singular thought, is determined relationally. For something to be the object of a de re thought, it must stand in a certain kind of relation to that very thought. So the idea is that in some cases, we are actually directly related to the object. We can see it, for example. Not only we can see it, but if someone told to me, told to me about someone, someone tells me a story about an individual whom he knows, that's enough that it establishes via communication a sort of connection to the object. So there are all sorts of relations we bear to objects which make it possible for us to think about those objects. And those are all the cases in which we think about an object via some relation, direct relation to the object, as opposed to the case in which we are not related to the object, but we can conceptualize the object. We have a representation, a certain conceptual representation, and the object happens to fit that representation. So that's the contrast. And, and that suggests that there can be modes of presentation, ways in which we think of an object, which are not descriptive if they are based on certain relations. So for example, if I see an object, there is a certain mode of presentation. The object appears to me in a certain way. I'm, through the, the perceptual relation to the object, I'm able to think about it. But still, I'm not thinking of the object as the object that has such and such properties. I'm thinking of the object demonstratively, that thing. And it's the relation to the object that grants the mode of presentation. So I use mental files to capture this notion of a non-descriptive mode of presentation based on a certain relation to object. The idea is that when we encounter objects in the environment, when I meet someone, when I see, well, anything, 
whatever. We, we sort of open a file about the object, the file, a file that's sort of based on a certain relation to the object. Thanks to the relation to the object, we gain information about it. That is, we see its properties, we gain information, and we can store the information in the file about the, obje the object. But what determines the reference of the file is not the information in the file, because it may be mistaken. What determines the reference of the file is rather the relation. So when I see someone, I open a file for the person I see, and, and I store all sorts of information about that person. I hear that he's a philosopher, and this and that. I've got all sorts of information I can put in my file. But my file is about the person I'm seeing. So the relation to the person determines the reference. And we can have different types of relations and different types of files corresponding to these relations. And those files will play the role of modes of presentation, but they will not be descriptive. Again, the paradigm case is the case of the demonstrative thoughts, in which there is a certain relation to an object that the subject is perceptually tracking. And in virtue of that relation, the object can gain information about the object just by looking. And the demonstrative file, that object, that person, serves as a repository for information you gain in that way. And, and similarly, when you think about yourself, I would say the same thing. You have a file about yourself uh, that's based on the fact that you, have a, you stand in a very unique relation to yourself. You are yourself. And because you are yourself, you can gain information about the individual whom you happen to be in all sorts of ways in which you can gain information about no one else. For example, from inside, from, through introspection or proprioception. So there are ways of gaining information about an object which are only available to you if you are that object. And I think that the self file is the sort of file in which we store that sort of information. But I won't go into that. The important thing is that mental files thus construed, they contain information about objects, contain descriptive information, what we believe about the object. But what determines the reference is not the content of the file, but the acquaintance relation on which the file is based, where the acquaintance relation is the sort of relations that justifies opening the file and which makes it possible for us to gain information from the object, information which goes into the file. So on this picture, as I said, and when I talk about mental files, I'm talking about the mind. I'm not, but there is a connection to language. I'm going back to language in, in a moment. But but the idea is that by deploying a, a mental file in thought, the subject can think about the object in virtue of standing in the relevant relation to the object. So I can think about an object which I see. I can think about it simply in virtue of seeing it. I can form a demonstrative thought, that thing, based on this perceptual relation. So mental files, because they are, can be used to think about objects in virtue of standing in certain relations to them, they are a bit like singular terms in the language of thought. In thought, we can mentally refer, refer to objects by deploying the files based on certain relations to objects. So if we want to go back to language, I want to ask the question, so OK, there are ways of referring in thought, ways of thinking about objects. And those ways of thinking about objects are, as it were, directly referential when they are based on relations to objects, like the perceptual relation. But what about singular terms in language? So the move I want to make here is something that's, of course, very controversial. That's the idea that the mind comes, comes first. That is, reference is something that happens in thought. We, you can think about objects. And you can talk about objects because you can think about them. And when you use an expression, you associate a mental file with the expression you use, and the expression inherits the reference of the file that you associate with it. So the idea is an old idea of, uh, that was pushed by ordinary language philosophers. Reference is not something which words do. Uh, words don't refer. What refers is the subject uses words to refer, and, and this is done by associating the expression with a particular mental file. Well, the mental file itself refers, because the mental file is based on a certain relation to the object in virtue of which it can refer. So this idea that uh, the theory of reference has to proceed via a theory of thought, the theory of reference for language has to proceed via a theory of reference for thought, is an idea that was classically expressed in a number of uh, 
places, including that rotation from Charles Chastain in 1975, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to assume that. Now, suppose we accept that. So we accept that, there, that we have ways of thinking about objects, uh, ways of entertaining singular thoughts about objects, based on certain relations in which we stand to objects, by deploying mental files based on those relations. And when we refer to an object in speech, and we express a singular thought in speech, that's because the expression we use is associated with a mental file itself based on a certain relation to the object. That's the, the idea. And if we accept that, then I think we can make sense of the, the million protest and the million position uh, that I mentioned earlier with the quote from General Marti. That is, we can maintain, as she wants to, that the descriptive content of a description that's used referentially doesn't play any reference-fixing role. The idea is that even if you use the descriptions like the US president, when I want to talk about Mike Pence, Mike, Mike Pence and I say the US president, the description encodes a certain descriptive condition, but that condition is not what is fixing the reference. When I'm expressing a singular thought about Mike Pence by saying the president is very young, what fixes the reference is not the content of the description, the descriptive condition being the president. What fixes the reference is the fact that that's the guy I'm looking at. That's the guy I'm concerned with. And that's typical of the referential uses of descriptions according to Denelan. So in this case, the description is associated with a mental file, but the mental file is the mental, my mental file about that guy, my expense. And it turns out that me that mental file contains the description U.S. president, because I believe that he's the U.S. president. That's the reason why I refer to him by using the description the U.S. president. But even though my mental file contains that bit of descriptive information, what fixes the reference of the file is not the information it contains, which may be mistaken. What fixes the reference of the file is the perceptual relation. So, this is the famous, one of the famous Donnellan examples of a referential use of a definite description. It says, one is at a party and seeing an interesting looking person holding a martini glass when asked, who's the man drinking a martini? So here the description is the man drinking a martini. And Donnellan says, if it should turn out that there is only water in the glass, one has nevertheless asked a question about a particular person a question that it is possible for someone to answer. So what Donnellan says is that here we're talking about the guy in question that we see, and we believe he has a martini glass, that's a mistake, but we're still using the definite description, the man drinking a martini, referentially to talk about that guy. And in terms of mental files, we can say that what fixes the reference of the mental file which the speaker associates with the description, the man drinking a martini, is he has a mental file about the guy he's looking at. And because the guy holds a martini glass, he believes that the guy in question is drinking a martini. So in his mental file, he has the information drinking a martini. So when he wants to refer to that guy, he uses the description, the man drinking a martini. But the person he's talking about, the reference, is determined by the relation, the fact that that's the guy is looking at, the relation that underlies the, 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 the deployment of the file. So the information in the file doesn't fix the reference. It has a different role. What fixes the reference is the relation. And it's because the reference is fixed relationally rather than satisfactionally that this is a case of expressing the singular proposition about the guy in question. The speaker is thinking and talking about a particular guy even though the guy in question doesn't fit the condition that is expressed by the definite description. That doesn't matter that the, the guy doesn't fit the condition because actually what fits his reference is not the condition. So now the full quotation from Marty, I think we, it's sort of indicated by that type of example. She says, what defines the referential use of a definite description of any device is the absence of a semantic mechanism to search for and determine the reference. Here we do have a descriptive condition, but it doesn't fit the reference. If a definite description can be used as a device of direct reference, the attributes associated with it should not play a role in the determination of reference. Indeed, that's what I just said about this case. 
it must be possible to use it, the description, to refer to an object independently of whether that object satisfies the attributes associated with the app. And that's exactly what happens here. We use the description the man drinking a martini to talk about a guy who is not drinking a martini. He's drinking water. And she concludes, that's the characteristic mark of referential uses of descriptions according to Donnellan. It's true that Donnellan makes much in his paper of the case in which we use a description to talk about an object that doesn't satisfy the description. So that's the sort of thing I want to say. I want to say that what ultimately matters when we try to to ground the distinction between singular thoughts and non-singular thoughts or directly referential uses of expressions or non-directly referential uses, what matters is the mode of reference determination. If the reference is determined relationally, we've got singular thoughts, we've got some kind of acquaintance with the object. But if the reference is determined satisfactionally as whatever satisfies a certain condition, that's not a singular thought, that's a general thought that's not about a particular object. And so we see what's wrong with the sort of Kaplanian picture. The Kaplanian picture was satisfactional. It only says that we have a certain condition that fixes the reference, and we may apply the condition to this situation or that situation, and that gives us different readings. But that's not what we want. We want a notion, a stronger notion of, of, of direct reference corresponding to the notion of singular thought, the case in which we think about an object in virtue of being in direct contact with the object or, or directly related to the object. Okay, so in the, I don't have much time, but still I may take a little time, if that's okay, to talk about the possible objections to this view. Yeah, I can take a little time, yeah. So many people will say, many people will simply reject the position, the, the view that I said, I will simply assume this idea that what matters is, is the mind and linguistic expression inherit the reference from the associated mental files where mental files are like singular terms in the language of thought. And they will say that the files, the mental files of the speaker, or the hearer for that matter, of course that may be very important in communication. What you have in mind is very important. In order to understand what you're saying, you have to understand what you have in mind. But this notion of reference, what the speaker has in mind, what he's referring to, what he's talking about, this is not a notion that's directly relevant to semantics. If we're interested in language, we want to do semantics. The mental states of the speaker and the hearer have only a secondary role, as it were. And there is this, this distinction in the literature between speaker's reference, what the speaker is referring to or talking about, what the speaker has in mind, and semantic reference. And it seems that here what we have is exactly an illustration of that. So when you say the, 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 the man drinking a martini, uh, when I'm asking a question about the man drinking a martini, in Donnellan's example, the individual I have, I have in mind is the guy I'm looking at who holds a martini glass. He's the speaker's reference. He's the person I have in mind, the person I'm talking about. But is he the semantic reference of the description, the man drinking a martini? No. The people who maintain this distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference, they say that the semantic reference is precisely whoever, if there is such a guy, whoever is drinking, is uniquely drinking a martini. So suppose this is a variant on the Donnellan case that I've been uh, talked about. Suppose, I think Donnellan in his paper talks about the case in which it happens that behind the curtain, there is another guy drinking a martini. And no one knows about him. He's hidden, drinking martini. No one, the speaker doesn't know about him. The hearer doesn't know about him. So according to this view, when the speaker says the man drinking a martini is a philosopher, for example, looking at the guy who holds the martini glass, the guy he's looking at is the speaker's reference, the person he is talking about. But the semantic reference of the definite description is the guy who's actually drinking a, a real martini behind the curtain, the guy that no one has in mind. So there is a sort of separation between semantic reference, which is a matter of satisfaction indeed, and, and speaker's reference, which is a matter of maybe acquaintance relations. So the, so the people who say that, they want to say that all this story which I've presented in terms of mental files, relational determination of reference, singular thought, may be right as a theory of the mental states uh, that, uh, that, that play a role in communication, in referential communication. But they are irrelevant to semantics, because for semantics, we have to stick to this more satisfactional notion. And 
a, a, a very strong argument in favor of that view is that it's very intuitive that there is a distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference. Because semantic reference, because it's semantic, it has to, if you make a, a mistake, like when I, when, I, when I talk about the guy who's not drinking a martini by saying the guy drinking a martini, it's a mistake. So how could I say something true uh, by, saying such, by, by using such a description? Uh, it, it seems really that it's the, the first thing to do, if, if something is to count as semantic reference, it has to satisfy what's encoded by the expression. And here the expression encodes a certain condition being the drink, drinking a martini. So anyone who is not drinking a martini cannot be the semantic reference of the description. It can only be the speaker's reference, which is a different matter. So that seems to be very intuitive. Okay. Now, what can I reply? What I want to respond is first that on the view I've presented of reference, and now reference and direct reference, we no longer distinguish them because all reference counts as, all genuine reference counts as relational. It's the same thing talked about direct reference or reference. In this framework, all reference is speaker's reference because, as I said, what matters is the mind. The only reference there is is when there is a, a subject who is suitably related to the object that he wants to say something about. It's this relation that determines reference. So uh, linguistic expressions only refer because they are associated with mental files that themselves are based on such relations. So that, 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 that means that, indeed, reference is Peter's reference. But actually, it's, it's we can follow Donnellan. It's just a matter of terminology. Donnellan accepts that there is something which he calls denotation, which is very similar to what the opponents call semantic reference. So denotation, so in the case of a definite description, what Donnellan says is that the denotation of a definite description is the object, if there is one and only one, that satisfies the, the condition. So that's the denotation. That's a sort of property, semantic property denotation. But reference is something else. Reference is the case in which the speaker has someone in mind, there is a certain relation, and you express a singular thought about that object. So on this view, denotation is satisfactional, while reference is relational. It's a matter of having in mind. So that really seems to correspond to the distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference. But, so this is done in quotes about denotation versus reference. So, b sorry, before, <laughs> let, let me add something. If we have this distinction between denotation and, and reference, we can understand the, the contrast between the referential use and the attributive use of a definite description as follows. We can say, and that's really Donnellan's view, we can say that in the attributive use, when I say the president of the US, whoever he is, lives in the White House, I'm not referring to anyone. There is no reference. There is no relation. I don't have any particular in mind. But the description denotes someone, whoever is the president of the US. So the semantic contribution of the description is general. While in the referential use, when I say the president of the US has such and such property, and I'm talking about Trump or Pence or someone in particular, in this case, the description still has a denotation. It denotes whoever is the US president. But in addition, it has a reference. And the reference is the individual I have in mind. And they may diverge, or they may not diverge. So the idea is that really reference is a matter of having in mind. It's a matter of the mental files deployed by the speaker. Denotation is a matter that have to do with the satisfaction of certain conditions. So that's really what, the, as I said, the opponents, the people who use the distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference have in mind. And Donnellan has something very similar. That's the distinction between denotation and reference. But the point I want to make is that if we accept Donnellan's picture with denotation on one hand and reference, where all reference is relational, implies having in mind, and is, as it were, speakers, all reference is speakers' reference. If we accept this, we can still make room for a distinction between two kinds of reference, which we may call semantic reference and speakers' reference. So we may still have this distinction, but we must reinterpret it differently from the way the opponents do interpret it. That is, what I'm saying basically is that we can have both the distinction between denotation and reference, which is Donnellan's distinction, where reference is relational, is a matter of mental files, 
in contrast to the notation which is satisfaction, or we can have both this distinction and the distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference, where the, what's characteristic of semantic reference is that the, the conditions encoded by the, by the linguistic expressions are satisfied. So let me show you how this works. Normally, as I said, denotation reference seems to be the same as the distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference. But I'm proposing a new interpretation on which they are not actually the same. So we keep dominant distinction between denotation and reference. We say denotation is just satisfactional. The denotation of a description is just the object that has the property encoded by the description. Reference is a matter of having in mind. You need a psychological relation to the object for there to be reference. So, so reference in that sense is speaker's reference as opposed to denotation. Still, within the category of speaker's reference, nothing prevents us from distinguishing two cases. The case in which the object that you have in mind, the reference, counts as semantic reference because the conditions encoded by the expression, the presuppositions of the expression, for example, the presupposition that the, the reference is the president of the US, are satisfied. And cases in which the object that you have in mind is the object that you have in mind, so you're referring to that object, but that object is not the denotation. So cases of divergence, cases in which the speaker's reference does not coincide with the denotation, are cases that we may call mere speaker's reference. But cases in which you have an object in mind, so that's the reference, that's the object you're thinking about, and that object happens to be the denotation of the description used, which count as cases of semantic reference. So there are cases of reference because you have an object in mind, you're related to the object, those psychological conditions are satisfied, but in addition, the properly semantic conditions encoded by the expression are also satisfied, and that would count as semantic reference. So that's the proposal. On that proposal, we we, as I said, it's a very intuitive distinction, the distinction between semantic reference and speaker's reference when the speaker makes a mistake, for example. And we can keep that distinction even if we hold the dominant picture. So on this view, there are two conditions for something to be the semantic reference. When you use an expression, the semantic reference will have to meet two conditions. The first condition is that it's got to be the reference. And for it to be the reference, the speaker must have that object in mind. The speaker must be thinking about that object. It must be suitably related to the object. For example, the object is seen. In the case of the, the guy behind the curtain drinking a martini, the speaker doesn't know the guy exists. The hearer doesn't know either. No one knows. No one has a mental file about the guy. No one is related to him in the proper way. So, no, so that guy cannot count as a reference. It's merely the denotation, but not the reference. But take a case in which you're thinking about a guy, you're looking at him, for example, that's the person you have in mind, and you utter a description like the US president or the guy drinking a martini. The guy will count as a semantic reference. As I said, it's first, it's the reference that is you have that object in mind, you're thinking about that guy, you're looking at him, for example. And the second condition for the reference to be the semantic reference is that the presuppositions of the expression have to be satisfied. Now, a definite description, like the US president or the, the guy drinking a martini, carries the presupposition that the reference is drinking a martini or is the US president. So if you're using the description to talk about the guy who's not the US president, like Pence in the first case, or who's not drinking a martini, as in the Donald case, that guy is the reference. You're referring to that guy. You're speaking about it. You're talking about, it, about him, sorry, but he's not the semantic reference. So semantic reference requires a coincidence of the semantic constraint satisfaction of the condition being the denotation and the more pragmatic psychological constraint being actually someone that you have in mind. Which means that when you make a mistake, like in Donnellan's case of the man drinking a martini, there is a guy you're referring to, you're talking about the guy you, you look at, is the speaker's reference, but, the, but there is no semantic reference in this case. There is a denotation that the guy behind the curtain, but he's not the reference. And there is a speaker's reference, a mere speaker's reference, the guy the, you're looking at, but nothing counts as a semantic reference, because for there to be semantic reference, there must be the convergence of these two roots. <coughs> 
that's what I just said. Okay, and uh, and an interesting point. That's my last slide. Is it's it's very controversial whether this story applies to the case of indexicals, because in the case of indexicals, we also have certain conditions that are included. Like I say, u u is associated with the condition of being the person I'm talking to. I say I I the word I is associated with the condition of being the speaker, the, the, the thinker, or something like this. So it's not clear whether exactly the same story can apply, but, but, but I have an example, and I end on that example, that's just a suggestive example and not really sure what to say about indexical. But suppose that I'm watching a film, and, and I believe that I'm one of the characters in the film. So that's a mistake, but I believe that I'm one of them. And, uh, and at some point I say, look, my pants are on fire, and I point to the character in the, on the screen, which I take to be myself. And I say, look, my pants are on fire. And so I'm pointing to that guy, and, I'm, and in this case, the, the word I carries the presupposition that the referent is the speaker. And here, actually, the referent, the guy I'm pointing to, is not, uh, it doesn't, doesn't satisfy the presupposition. So I would say that in this case, the word I fails to carry semantic reference. There is a sort of confusion here. There is a sort of speaker's reference. Uh, but, but it doesn't amount to, to proper semantic reference. But I should not have mentioned that because it's, it's really very controversial. So I suggest that we stick to definite descriptions in our discussion that starts now. Thanks. Yes, I want to, so indeed I use the word acquaintance, which traditionally, and indeed in my examples too, uh, is uh, associated with the central cases in which you have d direct acquaintance in perception and so on. But, but what matters is rather what I said about there being a relation between the subject at the time of thinking or the subject thought and, and the object. So it's the relational component that matters, and I think that in the cases in which uh, so, for example, the case of Aristotle, if this sort of the, the historical chain picture of communication put forward by Pripke and others, Ditch and, and many others, is true, that means that there is a sort of relation uh, between the subject who, who thinks about Aristotle and Aristotle. Aristotle is not given directly to the, to the subject, as it was for his parents, for example, but via the chain of communication, uh, through time that goes back to Aristotle, there is this sort of, a, of relation. So the relation can be pretty indirect in a sense, which is why this notion of, I mean, word direct, indirect reference is sort of ambiguous. But the, the, what matters is that there is a relation. The relation may be, vicario, may be mediated by, by other people in the community. Still, there is some relation. So I think that uh, if, if there is someone I don't know anything about, so someone talks to me about I don't know, Marcel, or whatever, that's the name, French name. I don't know who that guy is. It's just I overhear a conversation about Marcel. I have no, no idea who that guy is. I can still open a mental file. The file is sort of empty. I don't have any information. But still, I've got this connection to the object via the fact that there are some people talking about him. And via those people that are talking about him, therefore they bear a certain relation to him, and via them I bear a relation to him that's mediated by them. So yes, I think that we can use this notion of acquaintance, which uh, some people call extended acquaintance, uh, to apply to those cases. At least I would say that they are as relational as the case in which the relation is more direct. 
and based on perception. Still, there are other cases that are problematic for this view. There are cases in which it's not just that you're not directly acquainted in perception with the object, but you're not even, you do not stand in any sort of relation whatsoever. Uh, so there are much more difficult cases uh, of, uh, in which we would like to say that there is something that's very like singular thoughts, but there can't be any relation. Like, for example, cases in which you think about an imaginary object or something that you, you make a supposition. You imagine that there is an object that has certain properties, and then you can think about that object in what looks like singular thought. And in this case, the relational condition is clearly not satisfied. There are also fictional characters. There are all sorts of cases which are very important, I think. But, uh, but my strategy is to consider that the basic cases are the relational cases. They are the cases for which we understand the notion of singular thought. And the other cases are sort of a build upon the basic cases. It's the sort of a extensions in a different sense. That is, they, yeah, they should be understood in light of the, of the basic cases. For example, the cases in which we pretend that we are acquainted to an object, take the case of a fictional character. Uh, the, the, the author of a story uh, uh, talks about, say, Sherlock Holmes or those people. And of course, no one is acquainted with them because they don't exist. But, but the storyteller pretends that is telling true facts about individuals who exist. So, so, so the pretense is a sort of a, something that's secondary. So what's basic is the case in which there really is a relation. But then you have other cases in which you pretend that there is a relation, and that should be understood in the same way. I understand that we will hear more about fictional characters on first day. But before that, uh, my comment is that is that uh, objections to your uh, views that you presented. Um, I would say that they are historically understood understandable because our philosophy of language started as a philosophy of mathematical language and seeking for a perfect language for science that was to the what and philosophers were going to build the perfect language of science on the basis of the idea of mathematical language but uh, that what was the starting point of uh, lots of misunderstandings in philosophy of language, because philosophers started to think that, you know, what one would say that uh, language of mathematics is a perfect kind of language, and any other language like natural language is a worse kind or diverted kind or something like that of language. For example, Alfred Tarski wrote something like this in his famous article. Um, uh, nevertheless, lots of philosophers think about natural language as a language of uh, mathematics and they, and they have tendency to interpret um, utterances and expressions of natural language in that manner, so they uh, demand uh, and they seek for interpretations of that kind. So, so they tend to interpret everything, everything literally as it is in mathematics, because in mathematics everything, is, everything has got the one sense at the one basic level, and any other interpretation is not allowed. So they seek, seek for the same here. But I would say they are childish, naive, or something like that, because uh, in real mathematical language is only a very special, detailed kind of uh, language. Uh, other languages work in other ways, and their objections shouldn't be taken in, into account, I would say. Indeed, there is this uh, history of the reflection on language on the part of philosophers of logic and mathematics. <laughs> but, uh, but, but if you look at the people who actually made the claims that you're alluding to, you mentioned Tarski, Frege too, I mean, was famous for 
But if you look in detail at what he says, so he, he also uses this uh, comparison in the case of the eye and the microscope, saying that the eye is deficient in certain ways, which make it necessary to use the microscope. But he says at the same time uh, that uh, for so it's only for certain uses that the eye would not suffice, and you need the microscope. But there are also properties which make the, the eye irreplaceable and, 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 in a sense, much more powerful sort of tool as the microscope. So it all depends on the use you want to make of, uh, of, of the tool. So indeed, uh, natural languages are deficient in certain ways for certain uses in science. So that was the idea of, uh, of Frager. But for the ordinary communicative uses, they are just fine. So I think that uh, so even in someone like Frederick fully acknowledged that that uh, that it's a matter of use and that it, we are concerned with the the use of ordinary language in communication. Uh, they are fine as they are, even though in their case there is this sort of gap between the expression itself and the use that is made of it, which heavily depends upon context. And that's something that in the framework I presented is. Uh, is captured by this idea that what actually does the reference is the associated, the file you associate with the expression. While, of course, for a language, the sort of language that Frederick wanted to devise, it was essential that the expression itself contains all that's needed to actually fit the reference. It need not be something external to language, something like the context of use or the psychological states of the speaker that must not be what determines the reference if you want to do a certain use of the language uh, the sort of use that he wanted to make, but but here we are concerned with communication, and that's a very different story. Yeah, that's because they s sought for eternal eternal sentences. They wanted to write their science. They still perhaps want to write science in sentences which are eternal and equally interpreted in any time by anyone. That that was the purpose. Yeah, context sensitivity and ambiguity were supposed to be problems for, for yes. Yeah. Uh, so all semantic relations are from a, a kind of model. So these considerations are about the real world, I guess. So, so the valuations are not fixed and you can sometimes improve, for example, in this Dolerant case, you can say, okay, you are mistaken. You don't know what this man drinks, but he drinks something. And this is a true uh, statement. So what is the role of correctness? You know, because of satisfaction must be correct or not. For example, I remember well, it happened 60 years ago, they remember this case very well. It was a discussion uh, about Nobel Prize winner in literature in 1957. And someone told that Camille was awarded for Colabrino. For what? For Colabrino, the Roman written by Roman Roland. I remember this exam because, you know, my school was not teaching of Western literature at the time, so I was very jealous that these people know such, <laughs> such sophisticated things. But then I became interested and I tried to find this book. And to my surprise, it was not Camille, of course, but he was around at the time. But what about reference of this conversation? This person referred to Roman Roland or, or to Albert Camus. And so this problem, I think, is difficult to solve on any theory which you present. Because uh, in formal languages or, or formalized, the task is principle was all semantic considerations must be used with respect to proper uh, interpreted languages. Formalized, later he was more liberal about national language, but formalized languages, but still interpreted. So, you know, I, my question is, it, is it possible to speak about, to understand the problem of reference without 
uh, taking into account uh, sentences or propositions anyway, because it seems to me that we refer only in the context of propositions. Okay, so that's uh, the last sentence would open sort of a discussion on, on its own, but, uh, but the issue of uh, First, the example you gave of confusion in this case, in which you're tracking two objects at the same time, two individuals at the same time, and you're confused. So there is the issue of what the reference is in, in such cases of confu confusion. But, but the first issue you raised is that of correctness. So my point was very simple. My point that was that if you want to do semantics, the theory of a language, of a, you say the theory of truth conditions, you associate the meaning of, a, of an utterance with, with its truth conditions, you think there is a relation between them, then you cannot, it's a, a, impossible to say that, for example, that you might say anything true by saying DF is G if the individual you're talking to is not actually DF. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's pretty obvious that uh, any sentence that has, so, so some, some people have inter interpreted Donnellan as saying basically this, that an utterance like uh, the president is uh, young, for example, could be true if the speaker is referring to a guy who is not president, but happens to be young. So the idea of Donnellan is that what was said was true if the speaker was talking about someone who is young, even if that person is not president. And the objection one can make is that it, a sentence like the president is young cannot be true in a circumstance where the person who is actually president is not young. So there are certain conditions, correctness conditions, that are conveyed by the sentences themselves in virtue of the semantic rules of the language. And, and there is no way in which you could Imagine that such a sentence could be true in a circumstance in which the truth conditions in question, the requirements in question, the semantic requirements are not satisfied. So that's a, a significant objection to Donnellan. And I think that we have to accept that. That is, cases in which the speaker makes a mistake are cases in which what the speaker says, uh, or, or rather the utterance itself, cannot be evaluated as true. So I think that's, that's right on the part of the objectors to Donnellan. And the fact that what is said cannot be evaluated as true uh, also casts doubt on the fact that the individual whom the speaker referred to by saying the president, the individual who is not the president, that casts doubt on the fact that that individual is the semantic reference. So I think this is all, uh, uh, as it were, things that objectors to Donnellan have said. But I think that it is possible to accept all of that, to say that when you use the president to talk about someone who is not the president, or when you say the president is F in a circumstance in which the, the real president is not F, those are cases which, in which you're not semantically referring to the guy, and you're not saying anything semantically true. So that's not true. But still, I think it's possible to keep a lot of Donnellan's position by saying that even though the guy is not the semantic reference, he's still the reference in a more psychological sense, and I think you would, you would accept that. So there is a psychological sense in which that's the guy you are talking about, but that's not the semantic reference because there is this properly linguistic conference that's not satisfied. And the same is true about truth. Uh, you cannot say true thing if you say P, and if it's not the case that P, you cannot consider that your utterance P was true. And, and it's true that, that Donnellan sort of a sometimes speak as if for him it was possible to say something true by using a sentence P even though it's not the case that P. So that's not, that's the only thing I, I wanted to say when I talk about correctness. I mean that there are certain constraints, certain requirements that come just from the rules of the language, the semantic uh, interpretation of the words that we use and those requirements cannot be ignored in theorizing about truth conditions, about content. But I still think that this is compatible with Donnellan's main, main point, provided we distinguish between, say, reference and semantic reference, something like this. And uh, maybe, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the question about your theory, whether it's 
um, equally concerns uh, talking about uh, like ordinary concrete objects and abstract objects. So can I like directly repair and get a mental eye and this relation to uh, like abstract objects or like a property or something like that. For example, um, I may um, like directly refer to an ordinary like concrete object, which is let's assume uh, it is a concrete object, um, a certain joint stock company that is named ABC and was created at certain day, etc., etc. Et or I may refer to a uh, the joint stock company as such, but I may not have in mind like uh, referring to all the existent joint stock companies that um, have the property of being joint stock company, but just to refer to the singular objects like the legal institution that is the uh, joint stock company like in a theoretical debate. So uh, my question is whether your theory uh, applies to that uh, the same. I, I'm afraid I've not understood the example you gave, but, but for the general problem that you, you raise, uh, it, that's not something that I've sort of uh, sufficiently explored, but my, my inclination is to say that, uh, of course, when I said that we must be related to, to, to the thing that we talk about, that seems to put restrictions on reference that we can only refer to objects that we can bear, say, causal sort of relations to, and that uh, seems to exclude abstract objects from the realm of reference. But actually, on the Thursday, we're going to talk about, uh, about fictional characters, which in a certain sense can be construed as abstract objects themselves. And, uh, and when thinking about those cases, I think that it is presumably possible to talk about abstract objects uh, if, for example, you bear the relevant relation to instances or things like that. So for example, you can have types and if you bear a relation to token of the type, that provides you with a sufficient grasp of the, of the type to be able to refer to it and to have a mental file. But that me, that's mediated by the, your relations to the tokens, for example, of the type. So yes, I'm willing to be liberal in that respect. But of course, much more needs to be said about the, yeah, the conditions under which that's possible. But that's my inclination, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a question somewhat from the speaker's perspective. And I have a question about the hero, because the, whether the hero accepted, the, you know, properly understood the reference, uh, because it was wrong semantic reference. So I'm asking, what was the, the mechanism that allows uh, the hero to recognize the non-semantic speaker's reference? And uh, the follow-up question is, uh, what are the conditions for successful communication in, in this model? Because I guess it successful, it has to be understood by the hero also. Yes, so that's a, well, that's a very difficult question. The idea of uh, no one knows really what the theory of successful communication is. Many people are working on that. But, but, but regarding the, so what makes it possible for the hero to understand the speaker, whether, the, <laughs> so in, in terms of mental files, I think that basically, uh, so you have mental files based on certain relations to objects. Uh, so one thing is that, for example, if you use a demonstrative, you refer to an object. You say, that guy. Uh, so you have to deploy a file that's based on a certain relation, perceptual relation to a guy. And if I'm talking to you and you want to understand me, you have to try yourself to put yourself in a position to entertain the same sort of perceptual relation to the object. So you will see what I'm looking at and you look in the same direction. And when you yourself see someone, you will be able then to open a file that's relatively, uh, uh, that, that would be relevantly similar to mine. Uh, so that's, that's the condition that uh, you, but, but, but in general, I think that what makes it possible to coordinate the mental files of the speaker and the hearer is actually the content of the files. So when I use a definite description like the president or the man drinking a martini, or when I use a, an indexical, all those expressions, as I said, they encode descriptive conditions. And those descriptive conditions correspond to something in the content of the file. So you have this file about the guy you're looking at, and, and in that file you have the information, is drinking a martini. That's misinformation, but, but that's part of your file. And the reason why you utter yourself the description, the man drinking a martini, in talking to your friend, 
is because you assume that your friend is looking in the same direction. You also see the guy, he sees that that's a martini glass, and therefore in his own file, he has also the same bit of information, uh, drinking a martini, which will make it possible for the hearer to activate the right file about the same object. And the coordination is done via some piece of information that's common to both files. Now, in this case, it turns out that this is the same sort of file because we're both looking in the same direction. But if I say to you uh, something about me by using the word I, uh, I have got a file about myself, which I say is based on the, on the particular relation, very unique relation I have to myself. I'm identical to myself. I have a self file. But when you think about me, you don't think through a self file, of course. Your file about myself is a very, totally different file, like a demonstrative sort of file, that guy, or something like this. But the information that's encoded by the word I, namely the speaker, the person speaking now, this is part of my self file because I'm aware of speaking. And you also know that I'm speaking to you. So this bit of information is speaking now is common to our two files about me, even though they are very different sorts of files. So I think that a good deal of the coordination uh, between the files in communication is done via the, the, the information in the files, whether this information is true or not. So in the case of the, the, the martini drinker, even though the guy is not drinking a martini but water, I, I, I say the man drinking a martini, and you yourself, both of us, we may have this, this mistaken piece of information in our files, and that makes it possible to communicate about the guy, even though we are both mistaken, at least we can coordinate. And there are cases also where the hearer knows that the speaker is mistaken. So I may say the man drinking a martini is a philosopher, and you know that this is not a martini but water because you saw what happened when the, the, the glass was filled. But that's okay because then you understand what I mean. You have a sort of meta representation of, of, of my own mental state and, and then you can coordinate also in this manner. So there are all sorts of... But indeed, I take co linguistic communication to proceed not via the replication of thoughts because on this view, the mental files that we deploy in thinking about objects, they are really perspectival, that they're tied to the particular context in which we are because they depend on the relation we bear to objects. And in communication, the person who communicates don't bear the same relations often to the objects that they talk about. As in this case, I say I, when I say I, I bear a certain relation to myself and you don't bear that relation to me. So because we have different perspectives, we are in different contexts, we cannot think the same things if the modes of presentation, the non-descriptive modes of presentation we sort of deploy or the files are my file is very different from yours. We, don't, we can't share really the thoughts if the thoughts are individuated in the very fine-grained manner by the files. We can share the thoughts, but at least the thoughts can be coordinated. So I think that the communication is more a matter of coordination than replication of thoughts. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks. I have a question of clarification about the distinction between meditation and reference. Uh, it's a bit similar to the uh, thing that Professor Wallace said. So, so if I'm clear, like it could be the case that the notation uh, is something that the expression have irrespective of whether they are in the context of proposition or not by the reference is something possessed by expression within the context of proposition. So what's uh, indeed that's something I haven't responded uh, I've been responding to earlier, this idea of whether reference is necessary in the context of proposition. Uh, or not, because I wanted to remain agnostic about this. So why is it relevant to the denotation? Uh, like, like the thing is that like, your framework is very, like, at least as I see it and understand it, is very similar or has very many similarities with medieval framework of people like Ockham and Boyden, uh, where they exactly have this distinction of like, like, certain properties that like, terms have in the context of proposition or not. And so on, and it, exactly that's maybe the motivation of my question. Because then it changes quite, quite a lot to your perspective. What you can say about semantic properties in the context of proposition or not, and then exactly the question <coughs> is in, but pertain more to the context of how we use the word. So, okay, so first, so, so I don't know what's at stake with this problem of whether reference is only in the context of a proposition or not. I tended actually to present reference as something that's sort of self-standing. Uh, so there is this mental act of uh, referring to an object, and there is the act of saying something about it or thinking something about it as if this thing could be distinguished. So that's rather suppose the view that 
reference can be understood in its own terms, not necessarily in the context of a proposition. But, but I don't know exactly what's at stake, and uh, so and there is a literature on this, so I don't know exactly what the debate is, but I don't see the connection with the distinction between denotation and reference, because you suggested that maybe one difference between the two things, reference and denotation, is that denotation might be independent of proposition, while that wouldn't be the case for, for reference. That's not anything I said. I'm, still, I'm interested, and of course, I'm even more interested in the similarities with the medievals. But, but so, I, so I, I don't, so you have to say more about uh, this, uh, the connection with, with propositions. Yeah, I'll think about it and I'll come back to you. For Valencia, maybe you wanted to say more about this because you raised this issue of the reference being tied to propositions or not, and you want to respond to that. So. Okay, so the role of denotation, I don't think that so it's very much follow Donnellan, I don't think it plays a big role. The only role of denotation is it's sort of constraint on, on semantic reference. So the semantic reference, so what goes into the content is, in the case of singular propositions, when we express singular propositions about particular objects, what goes into the content is, in the semantic content, is the semantic reference. And the semantic reference has got to be an object that the speaker has in mind. It's got to be reference. But there is this linguistic constraint that this object has to be the denotation of the description used. So if you're actually referring to an object which is not the denotation because you're making a mistake, there is a reference you refer to that object, but it doesn't go into the semantic content because it's not the semantic reference. What goes into the semantic content is only the semantic reference. If there is no semantic reference because there is reference on one uh, side and denotation in the other, there's nothing goes into the semantic content, and that means that there is no semantic content. There is no proposition semantically expressed. So I deny what, of course, the people who defend this idea of semantic reference versus speaker's reference, the traditional people like Kripke and others, I deny the idea that the denotation goes into the, the semantic content as it were automatically. It only goes if the denotation happens to be the reference. And then you've got an object, you've got a singular proposition with the semantic reference in there. So the only case in which the, we might say, in, uh, or it depends on the framework we use, right, we might say that the denotation goes into the proposition would be the cases in which we use uh, the expression attributed. But even then, I would say it's a general proposition, so it's not the denotation that goes in the, in the semantic content either. So I don't think that, yeah, so the only cases in which the denotation that is the object goes into the semantic content are the cases in which the denotation happens to be the object that the speaker talks about, the object that the speaker has in mind. In case of confusion, case of confusion that's a Im very important aspect of this, of, of this picture, uh, because that's not shared by many other frameworks. In case of confusion, nothing is said, nothing true or false is said. The speaker means something, possibly, but, but, but there is nothing true or false, because there are for example, in the, the case of Romain Roland and Camus, there are two objects that are being tracked at the same time. It's a confusion, and therefore, in this case, nothing, nothing true or false is said. Yeah. Like in general, for cases of presupposition failure, are uh, also cases in which nothing true or false is said. My question is if you are in a room where is, let's say, five Johns. So then, that if you use a proper name, uh, the name John it seems to work a little bit like a, like a description or like a property of a special kind. Yeah. Because still, the proper name doesn't work uh, mechanically and you don't know which one 
is referring to. Uh, yeah, I would. I'm, even though I started from the million view that names are types and so on, I tend to think of names more like a bit like definite descriptions or indexic, maybe, maybe more like indexicals than definite description. That is, I'm prepared to say that there is a certain condition that's included by a name, namely the metalinguistic condition called that way, bears that name. So when you, so, so in the case of, 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 of John, the name John conveys the condition that the reference must be named John. And now, when you speak in a context in which there are many Johns, that means that you have several files that contain the information called John, and any one of them might be the relevant file to activate. So when I say John, I have one of those files, and coordination with the hearer entails that the hearer must itself deploy a file containing that same bit of information called John. But if there are different Johns, that may be the wrong file, there may be miscommunication, so there are other contextual factors that will determine which is the right file to activate on the part of the hero. But, in, but, but I take it that there is the property of being called John is a property that plays a coordinating role that corresponds to some aspect of the content of the file, and that's fairly similar to what we have with indexicals, in which there is an element of descriptive content that's also contained in the file. Thank you.